welcome to Wiki Fiends. I'm your host, Joe. I'm David. And we're the Wiki Fiends. We're going to be reading some Wikipedia articles and giving you our opinions on them. So the first one we have tonight is the Fermi Paradox. Mm. Are you familiar with this, Dave? I, I think I might be. Fermi Paradox, named after Enrico Fermi, is the apparent contradiction between high estimates of the probability of the existence of extraterrestrial civilizations mm. and the lack of evidence for such civilizations. The basic points of the argument made by physicists Enrico Fermi and Michael H. Hart are there are billions of stars in the galaxy that are similar to the sun, including many billions of years older than Earth. With high probability, some of these stars will have Earth-like planets, and if the Mm -hmm. Earth is typical, some might develop intelligent life. Some of these civilizations might develop interstellar travel, a step the Earth is investigating now. Even at the slow pace of currently envisioned interstellar travel, the Milky Way galaxy could be completely traversed in about a a million years. Mm -hmm. According to this line of thinking, the Earth should, uh, should have already been visited by extraterrestrial aliens. Mm. In an informal conversation, Fermi noted no convincing evidence of this, nor any signs of alien intelligence anywhere in the observable universe, leading him to ask, where is everybody? Mm. There, have been many at- there have been many attempts to, attempts to explain the Fermi paradox, primarily suggesting either that intelligent extraterrestrial life is extremely rare or proposing reasons that such civilizations have not contacted or visited Earth. Now it's a it's a huge uh, it's a huge uh, article, but I'm going to skip down to. Um, I've definitely heard to, of this. I've definitely heard hy- this. I'm I'm skipping down to hypothetical explanations for the paradox. Uh, the first is extraterrestrial life is rare or non-existent. Mm. Uh, those who think that intelligent extraterrestrial life is nearly impossible argue that the conditions needed for the evolution of life, or at least the evolution of biological complexity, are rare or even unique to Earth. Under this assumption, with some advocates called the rare Earth hypothesis, a rejection of the mediocrity principle, complex multicellular life is regarded as exceedingly unusual. Uh, and then it, it goes... Uh, how it it lists all the all the things that have to go right for uh, for life to have occurred on Earth, mm-hmm. uh, a right size terrestrial planet, uh, the advantage of a gas giant guardian like Jupiter in a large natural satellite, conditions needed to ensure the planet has a magnetosphere and plate tectonic, tectonics, mm-hmm. the chemistry of the lithosphere, atmosphere, and oceans, the role of evolutionary pumps such as massive glaciation and rare bolide impacts, and whatever led to the appearance of the eukaryote cell, sexual reproduction, and the Cambrian explosion of animal, plant, and fungi phyla. Mm. Uh, The next one, no other intelligent species have arisen. It is possible that even if complex life is common, intelligence, and consequently civilizations, are not. Well, there are remote sensing techniques which could perhaps detect life-bearing planets without relying on the signs of technology. None of them has any ability to tell if any detective life is intelligence. This is sometimes referred to as the algae versus alumnae problem. Uh, Intelligent alien species lack advanced technology. (laughs) This is the next one. It may be that while alien species with intelligence exist, they are primitive or have not reached the level of technological advancement necessary to communicate. Along with non-intelligent life, such civilizations would also be very difficult for humans to detect. It's like space hillbillies. Uh, or like space space apes, I would imagine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Space chimpanzees, right? Yeah. To, skep- to skeptics, the fact that in the history of life on the Earth, only one species has developed a civilization to the point of being capable of space flight and radio technology lends more credence to this idea. Mm-hmm, mm. uh, now, here's the next one that uh, I think is, 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 more, is more debatable. It is the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself. 
Hmm. Uh, this is the argument that technological civilizations may usually or invariably destroy themselves before or shortly after developing radio or spaceflight technology. Possible means of annihilation are many, including nuclear war, biological warfare, accidental environmental contamination, or poorly designed artificial intelligence. Mm, like uh, a yeah, like singularity took over, right? Like the robots or something. Well, that might that might come to another. The singularity thing might come into an, another uh, theory. It might be a separate theory because I think that's discussed later. But uh, I think it's mainly mainly war and uh, pollution. You know, like a, I guess pollution might be pollution might be fall under it. Um, that also might be another one. Well, uh, it's, it's self destruction through it. Well, it's self sabotage. I mean, they all boil down to different yeah. ways of that, either through conflict or through uh, shitty stewardship. Now it says here. Uh, in 1966, Sagan and Sklavosky speculated that technological civilizations will either tend to destroy themselves within a century of developing interstellar communicative capability or master their self-destructive tendencies and survive for billion-year timescales. Mm-hmm. Self-annihilation may also be viewed in terms of thermodynamics. Uh, all right, I'm not going to read that part. No, I um, get I get the theory though. Yeah, it's kind what of do you, what do you think? What do you think of that one though? I I've definitely I've I've definitely read this one before. I like it's. I feel like they're kind of. I get what they're saying though. Like, because if uh, you know, like law of big numbers, that you know, there's so many possibilities for life, and there's not one that's ascended. You know, that's become like a god. No, I mean specifically. I mean specifically this theory. Uh, what do you mean? Like that that theory that intelligent life destroys itself. I I mean, yeah, I, I, it makes sense to me. I, I think it's kind of like it seems kind of they're jumping to conclusions a little bit. But I mean, I guess it I, I, it makes sense. I mean, it, it's it, it it's not a very complicated solution to the problem. You know what I mean? It's like, well, there could be like us, but there's just like a plateau and nobody ever gets past the plateau. And what? Yeah. It's kind of, I think that, I think the implication is, is that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's in our nature as humans to destroy ourselves. Or just, I mean, I think that's, I think that's what they're pointing at, which I mean that's something I do not agree with. But. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It it, it seems kind of um, irrationally nihilistic to me, uh, but at the same time, it I see a kind of logic to it though, uh, mm-hmm. because I mean, you know, with all the uh, potentiality, uh, in that we haven't heard one thing, that does. It, 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 you know, that implies something odd. I mean, I can... So, so, so far of the theories, you think this is the most plausible? Is that what you're saying? I mean, is it... I, I was going to... I'm surprised. I thought, isn't there, like, another one where it's, like, the idea is if life was advanced to the point where it could travel to us or contact no, I, us... No, I'm... I'm talking... There's a there's a whole, a whole list more. I'm, I'm asking specifically about this one. Uh-huh, uh-huh. This one about the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself. Right. I mean... I think it's 100% feasible. I don't see it as illogical. It's just kind of like... I would hope you not. Don't, <laughs> you don't... <laughs> Alright, so, so it's... You're saying it's more... Are you saying it's uh you're saying it's not likely but you could see it being the case? I, I might be kinda like it's a hard pill to swallow. It might be I, I kind of totally accept it actually, but like I kinda don't want to though. Mm. Uh, you know, it's kinda I feel like I'm having like a little I like I remember I've definitely read these kinds of things before and I feel like it kinda gives me in a, a bit of an emotional reaction. Like, well, uh, it's, yeah. I don't think you're, I don't think that's a, uh, you know, I don't think that's a, uh, off base, you know, uh, feeling to have about it. No, my brain says it's a hundred percent 
you know, not only true, but kind of highly likely in a way, you know, I mm-hmm. mean, based on, I mean, I, I don't want to get all into, oh, you know, the way things are going today or all that shit. But, you know, it, mm-hmm. I, I, I could, I, it's hard to argue with the kind of cold logic of it. It's just that, well, I, I, yeah. I would say the response to it is that there's no, there's no, um, there's no species who's, who has the sort of the, the biological functions that cause it to, to kill itself. You know, it, it, it doesn't exist in any species. So I would say it'd be, it'd be, it's odd to put intelligent life as the exception to that, you know, Mm -hmm. to, to, to engage in behavior that causes its own extinction. I mean, that's, that's, that's not that's not a thing that's found in any species. Well, is see like I wonder about that because it's like it's like the we can go so deep with this. I don't even know like it's like Well, uh, I mean, do you think can you think of a species that 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 is in there in their uh, you know, their 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 biology to destroy their their own species to no, to cause their own extinction? I think of things though like um what was the bird, the puffin, like with the colorful beak? Like it's like a that got driven to extinction. Are you talking about the dodo? Yeah, the dodo. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. And it, it's like, it's well, not, that didn't cause its own extinction. That was killed by humans. No, I know, but but what I mean is, it's like it wasn't. It, it's because of something about it was desirable. Like they're um, like in they're like easy to catch, and like there was something about them that was valuable. Like wasn't that essentially what led to their extinction? I don't, yeah. I don't know if I don't know if it was they were valuable, especially valuable. I I think they were just regular birds, but they were easy to to kill because they they were not used to uh, you know predators. No, but I, I was just thinking like what we as humans perceive as intelligence or IQ, mm-hmm. maybe in the grander scheme of things, that's a abnormality. You know what I'm saying, and so that it's kind of like I I don't think anyone would disagree with that. I think it it is widely regarded as an as abnormality. Well, human and, human levels of cognition. Well, and that's what I'm saying. Like the the natural idea would be, it's like if well, if intelligence, you know, this great thing that leads to medicine and culture and all this stuff, actually is this kind of you know abnormal parasitic thing. That kind of eventually just destroys itself, like a cancer or something. Like that's kind of, but like, like I don't like want to think that though. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, but well, I mean, yeah. well, let's you know, let's parse that a bit. Do you think? Do you think intelligence in itself is enough to sort of reverse? You know the 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 biological drive that all species have of to to maintain its survival. Wait, wait. Say that one more time. One more time. Do you think if if we're putting humans uh, as as a, a uh, an abnormality compared to all other biological species, right? Do you think do you think the intelligence of humans is the determining factor which which counteracts the the biological factor that all species have? Of keeping, of keeping themselves from going extinct. Yes. No. I would. I would say so. I mean, it's what's you would say. It's you would say intelligence is the thing that would undo that that biological factor. I the thing that you know. You know, maybe we aren't broken out of the cycle, really. But it seems like, for all intents and purposes, I mean, we have, and it has to do with, well. It's. I guess it's, I wouldn't say it's not just intelligence. It's kind of this ability to marshal resources and ourselves. It's kind of it's group dynamics. Our ability to kind of function under ideologies or uh, methodologies. And I, I feel like that. Well, I mean that's related to intelligence, probably. I mean that it's kind mm-hmm. of you know it's to it's kind of the same thing. You know what I mean? It's but you're saying it's it's a, a factor of higher level intelligence. Right, right. To be able, 
Well, I mean, survivability, adaptability, blah, 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 blah. A lot of animals have that. But, I mean, I think the big factor is, I mean, you see it in the more intelligent animals that haven't gone instinct. Uh, it is this their ability to reason with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't know about, I don't know if I follow that. I, I, I remember reading some shit about crows, like crows kind of... Uh, yeah, they're supposed to be very intelligent. They're highly intelligent, and I think it, part of it boils down to kind of being able to operate within group structures. I, 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 maybe that's total bullshit. <laughs> I'm not yeah, sure. but that but crows are not extinct. Crows are are you know uh, extinction wise, they're they're on the level of least concern. No, but what I what I'm saying is is that there's a bond like there's a reason why they're still around and we're still around you know and i mean it might we're just a much much more dominating version of whatever Mm -hmm. has yeah uh, i don't think i don't think this is me stating my personal belief i don't think our intelligence or like human level intelligence is enough to or is it not even not enough but is the factor that that undoes the the uh the urge all species have to to maintain its survival so i mean i might be a little bit more optimistic in this it's not a it's not really a fear i have i mean but, uh, i my whole thing is i i know we want to you want to keep it focused on the kind of you know the, this this concept of intelligence leading to uh self-destruction but i mean mm-hmm. i i do kind of have the viewpoint that it's not entirely impossible that if a species advance beyond um, our capabilities, our technical capabilities, mm-hmm. that they would completely fucking ignore us. You know what I'm saying? That like you know, it's kind of like the whole fucking. Uh, well, that's a, th- yeah. That's a, this is another. I I mean, there's still a lot more under this Fermi paradox. Uh, right. Possible. Possible. Uh, explanations no let's, I mean, yeah. let's let's continue the next one is it is the nature of intelligent life to dest- uh to destroy others so that is uh that is uh, uh the hypothesis is that intelligent species beyond a certain point of technological capability will destroy other intelligent species as they appear mm-hmm the idea that something or someone might be destroying intelligent life in the universe has been explored in scientific literature. Uh, a species might undertake such extermination out of expansionist motives, paranoia, or aggression. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, mm. Let me see here. Cosmologist Edward Harrison argued that such behavior would be an act of prudence in intelligent species that has overcome its own self-destructive tendencies might view any other species bent on galactic expansion as a threat. Right. It has also been su- suggested that as a successful alien species would be a super predator, as are humans. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I mean, uh, I would say like, uh, I mean, do you think humans would, if you know, if another species started to 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 achieve the uh, the you know the level of intelligence as a human, mm-hmm. we would uh, we would eradicate them yeah i mean definitely uh they're a competitor i mean for uh, fucking resources 100 uh i don't i don't know if i would i don't know if i believe that humans would do that i i mean like, which human you know I mean, that's that's the thing though like i mean yeah you don't believe that but like you know there might be a huge you know i mean i mean come on like People do shit all the time, you know. I mean, you can't control or handle. You know what I mean? Like, well, I don't know what you mean by that. Do you mean like? I mean, I do, pers- you, yeah. mm-hmm. do you mean it would be a thing that that all that humans would have that? You're saying you're saying humans would would. You're not just saying you would have that desire. You're saying it, it's would be sort of human nature to uh, to uh, eradicate a, a, another species that. At the state we're at currently, yes, one hundred percent. I don't know. I think it could be a resource, but I mean, again, I might be more optimistic than most people. I mean, I I think 
I, it's not. I'm not totally nihilistic about this. Like, it's not like I think that it's never going to change or we'll never get past it. But you know, I, I mean, the proof's in the pudding, though. You know what I mean? Like, we we got a fucking uh, we got a a vehicle or two out there floating around, but we're too busy with our finger up our ass shitting on one another. I, I just it, I, if it's going to happen, it's going to be better men than what we are now. Uh, and I, I mean, don't. I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, are you, are you talking, you're talking, are you referring to this same intelligent life destroying other intelligent life? No, I mean us and like our capacity, uh, you know, to, well, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, <clears throat> no, I'm referring to us. I mean, is what I mean. And <sighs> why do you think, why do you think humans would destroy other intelligent life like let's say a uh, you know a dolphin a, 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 a large group of dolphins you know gain the level of intelligence and uh, you know communication abilities and, and you know higher cognition uh, you you believe that humans would want to wipe them out well maybe not necessarily wipe them out but it wouldn't be too different from the way I mean I well in some capacities I feel like portions of humanity would wipe them out like you know we we would introduce an alien race to genocide I think fear I feel like maybe not all of us maybe not even the majority of us but it's certainly a portion of us uh and, and yeah but don't don't you think there are you know groups that would uh would not want to do that I mean that it, it seems course, like it's course, not course. a foregone conclusion that humans would do that I mean, I'm sure some would, but I mean, it's, uh, I feel like it's a foregone conclusion because we know genocide is going to happen again against other humans. It's like we're the same. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that that's a foregone conclusion of of human nature. I think it is. I, I really don't believe that that it's in human nature to destroy uh, whole ethnic groups. I think it's a. a, a a, a corruption um, that's that's you know gained under uh, you know uh, political means. Mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think it has anything really to do with with uh, you know human nature itself. Maybe the ability to be manipulated has to do with human nature, but I don't think it's I don't think it's in human nature to desire that uh, either an ethnic group or a species is eradicated. Right. Well, I so. Mm. Like well, let me, let me, I, uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I would say, to your point, I wouldn't be surprised if there was another attempt at a genocide. Right. But I don't think I don't think it's a uh, I don't think it's a a, a, a a determined fact that it will happen. Hmm. Hmm. I. <sighs> I mean, I'm I I may be painting it more negatively than I mean to. It's like it's not that like. A solution isn't possible. It's not like progress isn't possible. I think it, it it totally is. I mean, it's just it's that's as feasible as you know uh, anything that can be achieved in physical reality. I, I just think that like I mean, you got it like pattern recognition. You know what I mean? It's kind of like it just boils down to uh, what is it? Statistical probability, and uh, you know. We're super lucky that no super predator has fucking found us <laughs> or they've considered us to be so little of a threat that they left us alone because shit like, you know, like, <laughs> well, you're, you keep, you're, 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 you keep edging into other, uh, other hypotheses that we're not, we're not at yet. We still uh, got, uh, we still got a, we still got a few more. Uh, so the next one is, it is the nature. Oh no, wait, uh, a periodic extinction by natural events. Uh, so that's just like um, extinction events. Like uh, I guess the it says the extinction of the dinosaurs is the best known example. So it's just like, uh, like real act, like cosmic accidents. Oh wow! Could be meteorite, massive volcanic eruptions, or astronomical events such as gamma ray bursts. Ooh, that's kind of like even <laughs> that sucks too. <laughs> this one, uh, so far, this one seems. Uh, Almost, this one seems yeah. like. Uh, of the other one, of the ones that are aside from like, they don't exist. This one seems like the most 
plausible to me that rational you know, yeah that a comet could just wipe wipe out a species oh they got super intelligent they took over some planets they may have sent out one scout but he probably died like you know like, all right well you keep you keep going to other things no let's see the rest all right inflation hypothesis and the youngness argument uh Cosmologist Alan Guth proposed a multiverse solution to the Fermi. All right, I don't like this at all. <laughs> yeah, all yeah. Hypothesis put, uses the put syn- down the bong. <laughs> <laughs> Synchro- uh, synchronous gauge probability distribution that young universes exceedingly outnumber older ones <laughs> by a factor of e e to the tenth for every second of age. Therefore, average over all universes, universes with civilization, civilizations will almost always have just one. All right, this just sounds like nonsense to me. I'm not even going to bother. Oh, yeah. No more. No more. Uh... Hey, what I... is this jerking off shit? <laughs> like, where, where's the reasonable shit? Like... I think I think uh, we should make Alan Guth sit in the corner. <laughs> Yo, he had some good ideas, but then he's just like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to jerk off now. Like, like, what if there was a multiverse? And... Uh, Blah, 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 blah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I. I mean, maybe there's, there's. I'm sure there's smarter people than me that, you know, believe in that and would be good at explaining it. But I. I, I well, don't. I yeah, don't care for it. I'm. I'm open to it, but at the same time, it's kind of. I, see, maybe this proves why. Uh, like, I'll never be visited. At least I just can't even fucking. Uh, well, I mean, I can comprehend it, but it's just kind of like. I don't know. It seems like you're just pulling shit out your ass, a little bit. All right. Let's skip to the next one. Intelligent civilizations are too far apart in space or time. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a long thing, but uh, problem might be. I have a theory. Let me hear the rest, but I'll save this. All right, say I'll tell you when we've exhausted it. Um, and there's a thing related to to the the not too far apart is that speculation by Sagan. Uh, Sagan and Newman suggest that if other civilizations exist and are tra- and are transmitting and exploring, their signals and probes simply have not arrived yet. Mm. Uh, however, critics have noted that this is unlikely since it requires that humanity's advancement has occurred at a very special point in time, while the Milky Way is in transition from empty to full. This is a tiny fraction of the lifespan of a galaxy under ordinary assumptions and calculations resulting from them. That's kind of so rational. The yeah, I don't. I, I don't really. Uh, it's too expensive to spread physically throughout the galaxy. I like this one because it's more like <laughs> it, it's more like a you know like a very practical. No one wants to make a collect call. Like no one's got a quarter. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, I. You know, uh, I that that like that whole thing about um, undervaluing time. Like it's like fuck. Like you know, humans have only been able to receive these messages for. A very small amount of time in a cosmic sense, and well, that yeah. again, again, you've skipped to the next one. Human beings have not existed long enough. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right. Uh, human humanity's ability to detect intelligent extraterrestrial life has existed for only a very brief period, from mm. 1937 onwards. If the invention of the radio telescope is taken as the dividing line, is it 1937? Col- really? As the of the radio telescope. Mm. Uh, uh, and Homo sapiens is a geologically recent species. The whole period of modern human existence to date is a very brief period on a cosmological scale. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. radio transmissions have only been propagated since 1895. Thus, it remains possible that human beings have neither existed long enough nor made themselves sufficiently detectable to be found by extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what Marconi didn't even do it that long ago. <laughs> like, so. Uh, all right. Humans, humans are not listening properly. Mm. That's the next theory. Uh, so I, I guess it's sort of, uh, signal. I guess we're not, not detecting it. Uh, the, the radio thing was all, was listed again. The next theory, they tend to isolate themselves. Uh, it has been suggested that some advanced beings may divest themselves of physical form, create, create massive artificial virtual environments, transfer themselves into these environments through mind uploading, 
and exists totally within virtual world, ignoring what? the external physical universe. Oh my god! It's like again. It may all. <sighs> well, this this was a uh, this was sort of uh, the plot of an episode of Stargate SG One. <laughs> so I'm saying, like, I I hate when they get this specific. Like, like put your dick back in your pants. Like, so annoying. Like, because like the theory would be just like, okay, hu- uh, life is not in the same way as us. They, but, like, to go to the full extent, they upload themselves. Like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> like, you know. Well, I, th- I, think the, I think the analogy used in SG-1 was, like, because uh, it, didn't, it didn't go well in that one. They abducted the SG-1 team, mm-hmm. and, uh, and they, uploaded, they uploaded the team in because they wanted new experiences. And the, uh, the, the, I think the science guy went, uh, imagine if you were stuck in a cabin for hundreds of years and all you had were five vhs tapes mm. so i well, i remember that one specifically it, isn't that kind of like that's like i mean i don't want we got tangents all over the place but isn't that like i thought that's kind of like the scientology belief like they like the idea of uh things going into people like ancient entities and that's like where things like personalities and shit come from but yeah, like I the, don't. I don't know enough about. Yeah, I don't yeah. know enough about. Uh, I don't either. Like, I, I probably just saw that on fucking South Park or something. Which you know, I mean, who knows? But uh, I, 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 yeah, that's what I'm, I like speculative science. But I, I, there's something like is annoying about it when it gets so specific. I mean, I, I that one seems like it's more the domain of science fiction. That's but, what I'm I saying. Mean, like, it's yeah. It's not. It's not presented. Uh, uh, at least in this Wikipedia page, it's not presented as science fiction. It's pre- presented as a Potential. theory yeah. that a scientist would have. Uh, that the the uploading and an increasing disinterest in their outside world. Hmm. Uh, so that's sort of like a reflection of like uh, when people are like, ah, you're always got your. All the kids today, they got their faces in their phones, you know? It's, it's sort of yeah, like yeah. old man, well, it's kind old of, man finger waggling. Well, it's kind of like, it's, it seems like it's kind of related to like some kind of, uh, some forms of like mental illness and shit too. Like these kind of like, like beliefs you're getting. Oh, like messi- drawing. Well, I mean, I don't know. All right, let's go on to the next one. They are too alien. Mm-hmm. Another mm. possibility is that human uh, theoreticians have underestimated how much alien life might differ from that on Earth. Aliens may be psychologically unwilling to attempt to communicate with human beings. Mm. Uh, perhaps human mathematics is parochial to Earth and not shared by other life, though other, others argue this can only apply to abstract math, since the math associated with physics must be similar. Mm. If In results, if not in methods. I, I- uh, physiology what were you going to say? This is kind of like Lovecraftian, right? Like, this is like the idea of, like, gas creatures or, like, things, like, colors. Creatures that are colors or something. Like, I kind of... Yeah, um, it, could, mm. it, could, it could be that. It could be that. It, well, it says here, physiology might also cause a communication barrier. Carl Sagan speculated that an alien species might have a thought process orders of, orders of magnitude slower or faster than humans. A message broadcast by that species might seem like random background noise to humans and therefore go undetected. Yeah, right. or an us too to them, right. And it also says, this under this heading is that uh, it, it brings up technological singularity and attain a post-biological character. We would, I, we would do better to make contact with something like that, like that. I feel like, why would you, like, imagine, like, we just meet another race of aliens that are just, like, sweaty humans. It's like, fuck that. Like, we'd probably, like, well, it's, like it, it's saying that, you know, like, if, if these are the, if another civilization has this, it would be difficult to communicate with them. I, I think we would, there's more to gain from communicating with something like that than there would be just meeting more humans to fucking fight with and be tribal and shit. You know, fuck that. Like, we should try to reach the light men. <laughs> the the gas mm. men. <laughs> like, they probably have the real shit we need. Like, Yeah, but I think it's like, well, you know, like, why would they even want to interact with us? You not, 
like I mean not to mention, you know, Wikipedia is our you know, is our, our beat here, but there's a concept um in T V tropes, the blue and orange um morality and the idea mm-hmm. is it's that like aliens have a sensibility that is so alien to us that it's just like mm-hmm. it doesn't even register. It's just like you know what I mean? Like they're like good and evil or things like that just have no meaning to another like like the idea it's it's important to say hello like to your friend like you know it's like that they're so beyond anything like that yeah yeah that it just it wouldn't even register as or uh senti- sentience you know what i mean like hmm all right here's the here's the next one everyone is listening no one is transmitting uh, <laughs> That's Alien civilizations might be technically capable of contacting Earth, but are only listening instead of transmitting. Transmitting. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> if, if all or even most civilizations act the same way, the galaxy could be full of civilizations eager <laughs> for contact, but everyone is listening. Listening, and no one is transmitting. Everyone's lurking only- on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, it's four chan. <laughs> yeah, lurk, yeah, lurk a more right, right. Like, uh, and then I- every everyone, everyone, on, everyone on four chan is human, and then everyone, uh, all the people <laughs> lurking are humans, and then other aliens. Fuck, I, that's well, <laughs> we as a as a as a human race should lurk more. <laughs> like we should we should stop putting shit out. We should stop posting on internet forums as a race. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah. The uh that'd be funny if an alien tried to contact human humans and the the uh the first place they went to was 4chan. Oh, but it just dude, got just like, like anywhere like that. Like it just it's like, got to- it just got tore like torn to shreds and then like immediately push to the bottom of the page no or like uh like an alien's first contact was with us was a comment on youtube and he tried to fit in like oh my god lol and everyone's like fuck you like this is like a <laughs> this is like a like like they did it like in a really bad context like on like a video of a funeral or something like oh my god <laughs> lol <laughs> no, that's depressing yeah yeah oh <sighs> Man, you know what though? Like, I like that the implication of like uh, higher intelligence being like super Machiavellian and like, <laughs> like really like into clandestine monitoring. Or just like, yeah, well, yeah. here's here's the next one. Earth is deliberately not contacted, mm. and this is uh, this is the zoo hypothesis. I, I, this is I'm kind of with this one. I, this is the one I feel like is almost the most believable in a way. Intel- it's uh, the the hypothesis states that intelligent extraterrestrial life exists and does not contact life on Earth to allow for its natural evolution and development. What's it? What's uh, it? The Star Trek? Um, what is the what the Grand Imperative? The prime, pro- yeah, Prime something. Prime, prime direct- directive. Prime. Yeah. Prime directive. I like uh, Grand Imperative too. Though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was just like what was that? You did a you did a thing like uh, <laughs> when you call you called the uh, the uh, you called the toaster oven a, a microwave stove. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off! No, I, I, actually, I really fucking respect the Prime Directive. Like, I feel like I fucking yeah. do it in like nor like everyday human life. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, that's probably that's probably a good like. Just like, don't get involved. That shit. Like, is, don't get involved with like petty shit. I mean, th- it's basically. Yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah, I guess if you extrapolate, that's what it it sort of is for human to human contact. The, the only way will be galactic gods is if we fucking drop petty shit. Like, <laughs> I one hundred percent believe that. Like one. Like well, that's that's sort of like why you got a, like you kind of. Uh, you kind of ridiculed me when I like yelled at that girl in Starbucks who was being mean to her boyfriend. Do you remember that? Yeah, wait, dude. Like you, you'll never make it to Starfleet acting like that, man. Like, <laughs> you'll never. You'll I, never like yeah. I called you because I thought like I had done the right thing, and you're like, no, you shouldn't get involved in that shit. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Unless you were like gonna arrest him, man. Like you know, like I mean, if you. 
I think deep down I I helped him, but that girl was being super mean and like I don't know. But you could be right, and I could be the big idiot. So wait, hold on. Let's just let's. Nobody fucking knows what you're talking about. What happened was is this girl was being really mean to this guy in in def- public. Yeah, and 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 she, he was like, I don't know if we should be together, and she was like. Of course we should be together. You're just too stupid to realize it. And she was, like, being super, super mean and, like, berating him in public. And she, like, brought a – she brought a friend. And whenever she would make, like, a point that was, like – to her was, like, a – you know, like a – you know, like a – a showstopper point, Mm -hmm. she would, like, go to her friend and she'd be, like, right? And the friend would be, like, yeah. And, like, he was just, like, (laughs) why? I just don't know. I don't know if, like – I, I don't know if we should be together. I'm not really happy. And she's like, she's like, you just haven't been in a real relationship. And like, I finally like lost it. And I was yeah. like, I, I went like, you're being so mean to him. You got to stop. Like, and then like, and then she like told the manager on now, me. You know what though? Like, I totally appreciate why you did that though. Like you, you are like, uh, you're like a, a, a little den mother sometimes. You're real, like, protective and shit. Like, you it's you flex your guardian sensibility in this regard. Well, it was going which is, on. Which is a noble like, noble thing, you know? Like, All right, well, let's go. Let's go. Uh, let's go on to the, the next one. Uh, they have one about how uh, the perceived universe is a simulated reality. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> Uh, it is dangerous to communicate. An alien civilization might feel it is too dangerous to communicate, either for us or for them. Mm-hmm. I guess this is sort of also like uh, for for us. That's sort of like the prime directive, right? What do you wait, say again? <laughs> Sorry. Is it is too? That's all right. It's too dangerous to communicate, either for us or for them. See, like that gets back to the lurking thing. Like, yeah, it's the, it's kind of. Uh, it's like the same thing in a way. Like uh, I that that makes so much sense. It hurts. Like, mm-hmm. all right. Uh, in the last two, they are here undetected. It is possible <laughs> that a civilization advanced through advanced enough to travel between the stars could visit or observe our world while remaining undetected. And let me and tell the you, the final one is they are here unacknowledged. Uh, and, and the main article of that is UFO conspiracy theory. Now, you know what? I was thinking about this. Like, <laughs> until I see fucking UFOs flying around every day while I'm at work and I see an alien smoking a cigarette on the street, I don't believe they're fucking here. <laughs> until Until I see them... At Dunkin' well, Donuts hiding. with me. <laughs> Maybe I just don't acknowledge it, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, this you is... You don't acknowledge it, they don't acknowledge you. This is a very fucking good topic, and I honestly think there could be a whole... We could, we could do a whole fucking spinoff just on this topic. This is a <laughs> huge topic for me, like... Well, I, I'm sorry if I sort of ran rough over you at some points. I wanted to push through it because there was a long list. Absolutely. Do you, do you no, have absolutely. your theory, though? All right. Well, oh, fuck. What was it? Uh, I did. No, this is my theory. All right. This is a good theory, I think. If an alien race advances mm-hmm. their civilization to the point where they can uh, generate more resources from things, you know, to us, no, you know, we don't know how to harvest these resources. If an uh, alien race gets to the point where they could communicate with us, they could travel to us, they could do all this kind of shit, and they have marshaled their ability to generate resources so much, they wouldn't even need to leave their fucking solar system. They could just jump to another one. There is no benefit to a race that advance to contact mm-hmm. uh, fucking are needy asses. You know what I'm saying? I, that- th- I think that's sort of that's sort of uh, disgust. They're just they've got yeah they've got they've got nothing to gain from us. Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. I'm saying. Right, right, right. Like if they have ascended to that point where they could what is it terraform or build a, a, a Dyson sphere and get all the energy out of a sun and shit. You know what I'm saying? Like. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they just don't fucking need us. It's like, we're, we are just like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're like, uh, like a lost tribe, uh, in the Amazon compared to them. You know, they're, they're just, 
dominating every uh, – they don't even need to dominate. That's, that, that's the point. They're past the point of needing uh, domination. They can just, you know what I'm saying, synthesize. They don't, they don't have a need to, to, to get resources outside of their reach. I think, I think what, this, what this thing is like, there's no trace. So there, there's, we've never seen like an errant, uh, an errant vehicle, you know, like, uh, yeah, like, a, or like a, uh, another, um, pro, like an errant probe, alien probe or anything like that. Or yeah. Like a satellite or something or some shit like that. Uh-huh. Oh fuck! I can't. We gotta move on, dude. Like, all right. I know. I know. This one. This one was a long one, but I. I, I it was pretty fun when I found it. So. Oh my god! No, like I'm telling you, like these kinds of things. I mean, this is why there's fucking coast to coast. You know what I mean? Like you can just yeah. lose your damn mind in a uh, topic this deep. It's like I, oh, it's my uh, Wikipedia article is religion. <laughs> like you know, like oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like well, you fuck. like. Well, you you're not doing that one tonight, Dave. <laughs> It'd no. be too long, but uh, no. Go, let's let's go on to your your uh, your first one. Okay, okay. Um, all right. Let me see. All right. Do you want? I've got a medieval one. I've got one about warfare, and I got some psychology. Which one would you be interested in? Uh, what's the, what's the medieval one? All right. You're going to like this one. Um, this is three articles, but they're, two of them are extremely short and these things are all related. So I'm kind okay. of going to go over the highlights. This has to do with, uh, medieval banking. Um, you might have to help me out with the pronunciation. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, usury. Usury? Usury, yes. Yeah. It's is today the practice of making unethical or immoral monetary loans that unfairly enrich the lender. Uh originally insury or what was it again? Usury? Y- usury. Usury meant interest of any kind. So interest mm-hmm. essentially. A loan may be considered usurious because of excessive or abusive interest rates. Or other factors, mm-hmm. what is it, like predatory, predatory rates, uh, like like loan sharking. Lo- yeah, exactly. Historically, in Christian societies and many Islamic societies today, charging any interest at all can be considered usury. Someone who practices usury can be called usur, but a more common term in contemporary English is loan shark. Mm. The term may be used in a moral sense, condemning taking advantage of others' misfortune, or in a legal sense where interest rates may be regulated by law. Historically, Mm -hmm. some cultures, uh, for example, Christianity and much of medieval Europe and Islam and many parts of the world today, uh, have regarded charging any interest for loans as sinful. So... uh, It might be in there, but I think think of, uh, of theologians... Uh, Calvin rejected the uh, the notion that um, that uh, interest that in, uh, interest itself was a uh, a usurious practice, and possibly also Aquinas. So they both wait. What are you saying? They I, I, I didn't. I, I, uh, did they reject it or did they say it as? What are you saying? That that that. Calvin and possibly Thomas Aquinas, although I might be mistaken on Aquinas, uh, were were uh, were in disagreement with the position that interest, in and of itself, was usurious. Hmm. I didn't. I'll look into that. I didn't realize eh, it makes sense, though. I mean, this is seems like such a such a common uh, economic practice that, like. Uh, it yeah, is. anything, any, any interest. I, I think that was a big, a big thing about um, uh, contempt of uh, of Jewish populations because they would charge, they they would give loans and charge interest, and they were sort of, you know, they they were kept around for that for for you know for the simple fact that they were able to give loans. Yes, yes. but at the same time, they were they were despised. You know, you know, I, I, I don't want to use that lightly, but they were despised 
for for practicing what was viewed as usury. I actually I didn't even want to like uh, talk about it, but how I found this article was through the concept of a court Jew or a, or a court factor, and that's exactly what it was. Is every fucking big medieval court would have a Jewish banker, and the point is that they were not uh, uh, what is it? They're not under the heel of the Pope or whoever. Uh, or of, of uh, quote unquote, uh, you know, Christian dogma, which right, right. I mean, I think we could, I think we could get into that. It's sort of, it, you know, it might. I'm not the best at, uh, you know. Well, no. Like, let me give the, you. Wait, hold on, let me let me push oh, through. I'm sorry, my, go let on. Me, man. Let me push through myself. Let me give you some of the uh, quotes from the Bible that refer to refer to this. Uh, Luke sixty uh, six three four thirty five. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting it to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good unto them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the mm-hmm. Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. So, mm-hmm. it's... Eh, you know, there's a lot of this kind of shit too. Like, you know, Matthew twenty five twenty seven. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that I, uh, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So, uh, but let me what? get let me get into uh, mm-hmm. let me get into this though. There were two methods that, uh, other than court Jews or court factors, uh, people got around this, uh, and I want to talk about these. <laughs> Uh, Go on. Well, yeah, yeah. The discretionary deposit. Uh, the discretionary deposit is a term given to a device by medieval European bankers as a method of circumventing Catholic canon law edicts prohibiting the sin anniversary. At the time, most Christian nations heavily incorporated biblical scripture into their laws. As such, it was illegal for any person to charge interest on a loan of money. The name comes from the working of the device. A rich person would deposit a large sum of money in the bank. His name would be kept a secret at the banker's discretion. As a discretionary deposit was seen as an obvious dodge around the charging anniversary. And it would have embarrassed the Pope, cardinals, and various nobles and merchants who made use of this device. Every year, in gratitude for the personage's deposit, the banker would make the account a gift. The exact amount of which would be at the banker's discretion. Of course, the gifts would work out to whatever the prevailing rate was, 8 to 12% perhaps. Should a banker's gifts be too little, depositors would eventually take their money to another bank whose gifts were more commiserate with the going rate. <laughs> Discretionary yeah, you de- can't... Huh? Oh, no. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, this is one. Discretionary deposit accounts were not demand deposit accounts. And so notification mm-hmm. of withdrawals often had to be given in advance, sometime as much as a year. Oh, God, that's a long time. Yeah, I know. That's like, <laughs> man, I would never, like, no boss of mine would ever let me take an account like that. No. Yeah. Well, I think what that might be like is sort of like a uh, like a, uh, a CD account, where it's like, it's not available, you know, it's not on demand, but it's, it, you know, you... It, it's you know it's it's uh it's being utilized by the bank and then you get the money back plus you know whatever interest is stipulated after the term is up right yeah. well i mean let me get down to brass tax what i think like this is just off the books i mean that's all this fucking is it's, you don't report it to the pope you know but you do what you want you know what i'm saying like it's kind of yeah that's the dodge you know yeah well you know to, you, it just like you can't you can't get away from markets you know mm-hmm. you can't get, you can't you can't escape uh you can't escape that all right let me tell you the other way uh the contractium tyrannus it was a mm-hmm. set of contracts devised by european bankers and merchants in the middle ages as a method of circumventing canonic laws uh canonic laws preventing usury as a part of christian finance 
at the time, most Christian nations heavily incorporated scripture into their laws, as such as legal, blah, 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 blah. To get around this, a set of three separate contracts are presented to someone seeking a loan. An investment, a sale of profit, and an insurance contract. Each of these... Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Each of these contracts were permissible under canon law, but together replicated the effect of an interest-bearing loan. The way this procedure worked was as follows. The lender would invest a sum equal to the amount of financing required by the borrower for one year. The lender would then purchase insurance for the investment from the borrower and finally sell it to the borrower, the right to uh, any profit made over a prearranged percentage of the investment. This system replicated the effects of a loan with any interest rate agreed between the two, yet provided protection to the lender against default. While the borrower uh, remained under the protection of the law when it came to collection of the money by threats or force, loan sharking. The church provided utterly unable to legislate against the contractrium trienus, and the idea <laughs> quickly spread to merchants and bankers across Christendom. It was accepted by writers such as Gabriel Bell. It helped in part to improve public perception of the practice of usury by moneylenders, and ultimately the doctrine was rewritten by the school of Salamanca and the ban on interest-bearing loans overturned in many Protestant countries, starting with England by Henry uh, V. Okay. Yeah, it's just kind of like, it's so crazy that, you know, it's like uh, you got to jump through so many hoops just to satisfy something that should have been, uh, you know, a more direct, a more direct transaction, you know? Well, it's just, you know, it's, (laughs) <laughs> that, that's the thing it's interesting both these things are about like kind of super rich the super rich in a way you know what i mean well maybe not i mean maybe maybe the contractorium was used against those maybe not of such great means but it seems like it's this thing where the king the king or uh, a large merchant is just like oh come on like i'll just make some shit up like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Like I'll yeah. give it back to you. Fuck, you know, you know, we see each other every day, you know, like, kind of a thing. Like, yeah. No, it's it is fun imagining like the petty shit from like people being petty or people being like like the small lives of people like hundreds right. and hundreds of years ago. Well, I mean, that's always a fun. I mean, the whole thing is kind of like the king of England fucking making his own church so he could divorce his wife or some shit like that. It's, it's all kind of, it, it's like reality hits ideology, like, like pomp, like pomp surrounding banality sort of a thing. Absolutely. Uh, or yeah, yeah. Pomp as an excuse for, or yeah, for banality, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's the facade of it. I did all of this <laughs> cause I hate that guy, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it is fun and it is like, I mean, that's like what a lot of like, you know, like, uh, like, uh, you know, like, uh, political dramas about, you know, like all the minutiae that you have to go through. Absolutely. No, again, this is another topic. I feel like, uh, your, your topic that medieval banking is a deep fucking well of hilarious information. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, just like minutia. I'm really into this. Uh, I'm really. This is kind of a. This is a hole I will be descending in. I believe. I have always. Mm. Uh, ah, it's such a good one. Can- it would, I feel like it. I feel like it'd be good, like stock for like a, uh, like a game. You know, like a good. Oh like, fuck yeah! Like a like a card game or something. Game stories. Any. Ah, this is just a. It's a fucking resource to be mined. Oh, it's such a good one. <laughs> well, I'm glad you found it, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, don't thank right. me. <laughs> thank Wikipedia? Oh, hail Wikipedia. <laughs> All right, what you got? All right, the next one I have is Presidential State Car, United States. Uh... The United States presidential state car, nicknamed the Beast, Cadillac One, uh, and First Car, and codenamed Stagecoach, is the official state car of the President of the United States. The Mm. current model of presidential state car is a unique Cadillac built upon a medium-duty truck platform. The car is equipped with many life-saving, offensive, and defensive measures. 
and is built to not only the United States Secret Service's standards, but Cadillac's as well. Uh, it first started in the early 20th century where President Taft uh, purchased four cars and converted the White House stables into a garage. Because his fat ass needed a big car. Yeah, he was a he was a gear <laughs> he was a gearhead. Uh, now the current presidential state car went into service on January twentieth, two thousand nine, and drove President Obama the two miles down Pennsylvania Avenue from his inauguration to the inaugural parade. Uh, the the Cadillac. Uh, uh, is not based on any single model of car. Though it has dual textured grille and the dinner plate size Cadillac coat of arms badge that are emblematic emblematic of the Cadillac DTS and the Cadillac Escalade. All right, so getting on to more of the interesting features, I should say, uh, the weight of the car means it can only reach sixty miles per hour mm. and only achieves. Eight miles per gallon uh, of gas. It's got to be loaded with weapons, then, if it's that fucking slow. The current model of limousine costs. Uh, it can range. It says it can range from fifteen thousand pounds to twenty thousand pounds. So it's like a, It's essentially a ten, a ten ton. Uh, yeah, ten ton. Car. A ten ton car. <laughs> yeah, they like after Tav. Like yo, we got we're hauling tons. <laughs> uh, the current model of limousine costs uh, three hundred thousand dollars. The presidential state car is maintained by the United the United States Secret Service. All right, it says here this is this is the more fun part. The doors of the presidential state car have no keyholes. Mm. The ability to open the passenger doors on the limousine is a secret known only to the Secret Service. <laughs> it. It has a uh, five-inch thick bulletproof glass, run flat tires, and an interior that's one hundred percent sealed to protect the occupants in the event of a chemical at- chemical attack. Shit. Uh, it boasts rocket-propelled grenades, night vision optics, a tear gas cannon, onboard oxygen tanks, an armored fuel tank filled with foam to prevent explosion. Pump action shotguns and bottles of the president's blood. <laughs> Yo, I want I want that shit in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I think it I think it would be funny to be like a uh, your Obama in the Secret Service. Like we got to show you how to use these shotguns in case of a attack. And he's all like, "All right, show me. <laughs> like, no, show it's me like, how to do it." It's like fucking James Bond and M. It's like this is the button for the foam. This is the button for your blood. Like <laughs> you know, like fuck. Like, I wonder, like, I wonder if they're like secret panels that pop out, or it's just like a mini fridge that is, has this blood in it, <laughs> like near like champagne and stuff. You think like if you're the president and you know you have that fridge, you just like on your way to see a. Uh, like a different diplomat, you just open up the fridge and look at your blood. And just like, I hope I don't need this. <laughs> That'd be like a funny, like a uh, a funny, like like smooth move for a date. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see here. The uh, current presidential state car can also fire multi-spectrum infrared smoke grenades as a countermeasure to per- to a rocket propelled grenade attack or anti-tank missiles fuck how many like fucking grenades are on these things <laughs> like, well those are those are smoke grenades not regular grenades no, although it still. does have rocket propelled grenades that's what i'm saying like. uh, yeah, so it's, <coughs> it's hermetically it's hermetically sealed meaning uh well, I guess like uh, I don't know. I you know I don't know the exact meaning of hermetically or hermetic. I guess it relates to a hermit. It's sealed away. I think it has to do with the uh, sealed from the inside or something. Like, well, it's sealed and it can't be opened through normal means. <laughs> yeah, you're saying like the Secret Service is the only ones who know how to open the door, and it's like they have to, you know, <laughs> they have to do a dance and. Uh, and it's yeah. all it, it's also cut off from the outside it's all, it's cut off from the exterior so it has its own air and i guess filtration or it has its mm. own oxygen tanks i see so you're not 
you're not breathing regular air, you're breathing its air. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Mm. Uh, it has uh, the communications capabilities include phone, satellite communications, and the internet. So, that's all pretty you need. fun. That's all you need. Yeah. It should have a toilet in it as well. <laughs> and you can just stay in. <laughs> and also, you can shit in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be like if they switched it from a, a Cadillac limo to like a... Uh, uh, a, uh, a Secret Service Winnebago. <laughs> I wonder who the president that said, like, yo, but can I shit in it, though? Like, <laughs> Well, no, it, it doesn't have that yet. That's if I become president. Nah, they, you know, that's... You don't know what it really has these days, you know? No, that's a good point. It's, it could be a, a, a tightly guarded secret. If I was uh, a world leader, whoever... Ever other world leader had a car you can shit in and no one would know and I'd be like that's the one <laughs> it's the, he's got his shit together <laughs> I mean there it, there is a link for official state cars so it's possible we could uh, find information on other countries presidential or prime minister cars mm. now this is car be force good- one this is pretty serious shit no it's it's uh, it's not called Car Force One. It's, it's the United States presidential state car, nicknamed the Beast Cadillac One or First Car. First Car. But its code name is Stagecoach. Fuck. Ah, oh, I wonder if they ever sell the old ones. Oof. Yeah, it's this hermetically sealed. Uh, Airtight. It's dope. I just found it. And then it also said that uh, the planning the the, uh, the planning involved in using the car uh, in, in using a motorcade is a uh, is a big ordeal. So uh, it's preferable to use Marine One which is uh, the president's helicopter. Mm. Because uh, it, it says there's a huge a huge motorcade, uh, police, uh, police cars, uh, sport utility vehicles to carry the Secret Service detail, uh, electronic countermeasures, key staff, a counter-assault team, hazardous materials, mitigation personnel and equipment, Uh, White House communications agency personnel, uh, and then press vans and and ambulance and uh, other, you know, what's needed at the time. Yeah, yeah, the caravan. Yeah. And I guess they're huge, the motorcades are uh, are huge, they're like, uh, you know, 30 cars or something. Yeah, this is, this is oh, wow, yeah, the caravan. God. Yeah. 30, 30 to 45 other vehicles. Mm-hmm. So 30 to 45 vehicles in addition to uh, uh, the uh, the first car. It probably is like a mobile town, like food, a doctor. Like there's one car full of shrimp, like one with a, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Like, oh. A bodega car? Fuck. It's like yeah. oh, Obama wants a Nutri-Grain. <laughs> Somebody get uh we need uh bubble yum at the first car stat. <laughs> yeah, bubble uh bubble gum to stagecoach. <laughs> Taft probably had a whole car of cosmic brownies. <laughs> I know I would. <laughs> cosmic brownies? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that marijuana brownies? No, there are these little brownies you can buy in New York uh, City that are like small shitty brownies that have like uh, multicolored uh, sprinkles pressed into them. <laughs> I, I can imagine that. I used to really like House of Bazzini snacks. Do you ever see those? No. They're Wait, good. What, I, I know. I don't want to get too deep into this, but like there's the Drake's coffee cakes, which are good. But uh, I can't remember all the brands. There's so many good brands. 
Well, that mine was an off topic. So it was House of Bazzini. It's got like those like uh, mixed nuts and like party mix and like uh, sesame bites and stuff. That shit is good. It's it's good like it's good like bodega or like like convenience store fare. Yo, uh, maybe I wasn't of the age to really care about this, but I feel like in New York, more than back in Indiana, I would see more um, uh, mixed bags that would literally be like an off-brand that would have like Doritos, pretzels, you know, like like a mixture. Like you don't... I yeah, don't, like like party mix? Yeah, or like Uts, like Uts party mix, like... I, mean, I see. You could get shit yeah, like that, but like it wasn't as ubiquitous, and like you know what I mean, like. Yeah, I I, I see it every once in a while, but uh, I'm talking more of like the um, the snack mix that I really liked. It was like it was called like party time snack mix, and I think it was like cocktail snack mix. What do you mean cocktail? So it had like little, but like. Like, it might have a peanut, but it had these other, like, really... I don't know. It was really good. I'm not even sure what they were. They had these little things that... I have no idea what they were. And every once in a while, I'll I'll see them. But usually, they have this... When I go to to a place that has Bazzini, they don't have the party time. They have the Cajun party time, which I don't like as much. Oh, man. You know I don't like spicy that much, so no, that's part I, of the reason. I'm trying to wean myself off it. It's better for your digestion, but fuck, Cajun anything. I'm down. Oof. All right, so let's go on to your next one. Okay, so um, I've got – let me think. I have a psycho- I have a couple uh, psychological things, but I think I'm going to do uh, this – these other topics instead. So this isn't from like a list or anything, but it's kind mm-hmm. of a, a similar theme. It's three small articles that have to do with uh, the use of animals in warfare. Mm-hmm. So uh, the first one I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do these in chronological order. Uh, all right. So, uh, this is about Olga of Kiev. Saint Olga, uh, born in 890, died July 11th, 969, Kiev, was the ruler of the Kievian Rus as a regent uh, for her son, Slytelaslav. All right, so we got um, we got a lot of bad Slavic names here. <laughs> I might fuck up. Yeah. So... Uh, this was this woman that served as regent for a time for his son. And what's interesting about her is, uh, the tactics that she personally, uh, employed during this thing called the Drevlian uprising. The following account is taken from a primary chronicle. Princess Olga was the wife of Igor of Kiev, who was killed by the Drevlians. At the time of her husband's death, her son, Slytoslav was three years old, making Olga the official ruler of Kievan Rush until he reached adulthood. The Drevlians wanted Olga to marry their prince, Mal, making him the ruler of Kievan Rush, but Olga was determined to remain in power and preserve it for her son. The Drevlians sent 20 of their best men to persuade Olga to marry their prince, Mal, and give up her rule of Kievan Rus. She had them buried alive. (laughs) She then sent word to Prince Maul that she had accepted the proposal, but required their most distinguished men to accompany her on the journey in order for her people to accept the offer of marriage. The Dravillians sent their best men who governed their land. Upon their arrival, she offered them a warm welcome and invitation to clean up after their long journey in a bathhouse. After they entered, she locked the doors and set the building on fire, (laughs) burning them alive. With the best and wisest men out of the way, she planned to destroy the remaining Dravillians. She invited them to a funeral feast so she could mourn over her husband's grave, where her servants waited on them. After the Dravillians were drunk, Olga's uh, Olga's soldiers killed 5,000 of them. She returned to Kiev and prepared an army to attack the survivors. The Dravillians begged for mercy and offered to pay for their freedom with honey and furs, she asked for three pigeons and three sparrows from each house 
since she did not want to burden the village any further after the siege. They are happy to comply with such a reasonable request. Now Olga gave each soldier in her army a pigeon or a sparrow, and ordered them to attach by thread to each pigeon and sparrow a piece of sulfur bond with the small pieces of cloth. When night fell, Olga bade her soldiers release the pigeons and the sparrows. So the birds flew to their nests, and the pigeons to their coats, and the sparrows under their eaves. The dove coats, the coops, the porches, and the hay mouths were set on fire. There was not a house that was not consumed, and it was impossible to extinguish the flames as all the houses caught on fire at once. The people fled from the city, and Olga ordered her soldiers to catch them. Thus she took the city and burned it, and captured the elders. Some of the other captives she killed, while some she gave to others as slaves to her followers. The remnant she left to pay tribute. So, mm. that's the first one. Well, she sounds pretty fucking brutal, thoroughly, but that last one. Yeah, well. Yeah, use of pigeons. That's, uh, odd. It kind of seems like drummed up. I <laughs> like she buried the first set alive. She killed five thousand of them when they were drunk. Like why would after burying the first ones alive? Like <laughs> you know why would you trust this person? No. All right, let me get through the other ones. Uh, the explosive rat, known as the rat bomb. Uh, it was developed by uh, British Special Forces uh, in World War II for use against Germany. Rat carcasses were filled with plastic explosives and were to be distributed near German boiler rooms, where it was expected they would be disposed of by burning, with the subsequent explosion having a chance of causing a boiler explosion. The explosive rats never saw use, as the first shipment was intercepted by the Germans. However, the resulting search for more booby trap rats consumed enough German resources for the SOE to conclude that the operation was a success. That's funny. During World War II, the BSO procured about 100 rodents for medical experiments. The rodents were killed and plastic explosives sewn inside of them. The idea developed in 1941 was that when a dead rat was discovered in a boiler room of a locomotive, factory, power station, or similar installation, the stoker tending the boil would dispose of the unpleasant discovery by shoveling it into the furnace, causing the booby trap rat to explode. Uh, a rat could contain only a small amount of explosive, however. However, a penetration of highly pressurized steam boiler could uh, trigger a devastating boiler explosion. A rat bomb could be also set with a delayed fuse. Operational history. The first shipment of carcasses was intercepted by the Germans and the plane was dropped. The Germans exhibited the rats at top military schools and conducted searches for further exploding rats. The, SE, uh, the SOE concluded the trouble caused to them was a much greater success to us than if the rats had actually been used. That's that's like I guess that's not quite like a terror, a terror method, but it's, it's like um, yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking that yeah. It's like it's like yeah, it's like a, a wasting enemy resources. I mean, so that's sort of like I uh, mean, that's sort yeah. of like um, like that's like I guess like that's the premise behind the movie The Great Escape to an extent. Is that they weren't just trying to get their? Did you ever see The Great Escape? Uh, I play a little bit of the shitty game. Uh, I yeah, the movie's much better than the game. The game was not very good. Uh, he, he could ride on a motorcycle. It was all right. Wait, it's, what, what's that guy's name? Um, fucking uh, Steve McQueen. Ah. Yeah, Steve McQueen. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, like it was sort of like they were all they were all POWs, right? But they they weren't just attempting to escape for their own freedom. It's like sabotage. It was like they. Well, they they wanted they they sort of heard rumors about that something big was coming, and I believe like it was D Day that was like it was to coincide with D Day was that they would attempt in a massive a, a massive escape so that the the Germans would have to look for them and would be diverted from the D Day attack. Right, right. So it's it's sort of like it's sort of like like wasting wasting your enemy's time on like. Uh, 
or getting them getting them elsewhere, getting them looking elsewhere and coming from another direction, you know? That's it's an interesting tactic because it's you do a move that implies you're willing to do these bizarre things. And so they're gonna spend all their time trying to make sure that that weird thing doesn't happen. Right, right. It's this, uh, you know, all you have to do is send one shipment full of rat stuff with bombs and you never have to do it again. Though we'll always look yeah. for it. Like <laughs> yeah. You could, you could just do it, you know, you could do, you could do a whole bunch of weird things like that. It's, I like this idea. It's like tactical investment, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, an invested action. That's really smart, actually. It's sort of this is not this is not you know it it's not the same sort of uh there's not the same sort of juice behind this but I know the U S uh was working on a bat bomb where it was bombs attached to living bats mm-hmm. that they would release from a uh, a plane uh over uh over Japan yeah I you and know the, that was one I I was almost picked for this. And they they blew up one of their own warehouses with one of those. They all got loose one night. Yeah, they never they never used it, and they ended up using a uh, atomic bomb instead. Yes, yeah. Well, less bats. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. So here's the last have, one. Oh, go on. Project Pigeon. <clears throat> um, during World War Two. Project Pigeon was America's be- uh, American behavioralist B.F. Skinner's attempt to develop a pigeon-guided, con- uh, pigeon-controlled guided bomb. The test bed was the same National Bureau of Standards-developed, unpowered airframe that was later used for the U.S. Navy's Ravar-guided uh, bat glide bomb, which is basically a small glider with wings and tall surfaces. The intent of Project Pigeon was to train pigeons to act as pilots for the device, using their cognitive abilities to recognize the target. One to three pigeons trained by an operant conditioning to recognize the target were stationed in front of a screen. When they saw the target, they would peck at it, the screen with their beaks. As long as the target remained in the center of the screen, the screen would not move. But if the bomb began to go off track, the image would move towards the edge of the screen. The pigeons would follow the image pecking at it, which would move the screen on its pivots. Early electronic guidance systems used similar methods, only with electronic signals and processes replacing the birds and detecting the target and preventing deviation from the guide path. The National Defense Research Committee saw the idea to use pigeons and glide bombs as very eccentric and impractical, but still contributed $25,000 to the research. Skinner, who had some success with the training, Complaint our prom was that no one would take us seriously. <laughs> the program was canceled on October 8th, 1944, because the military believed further pro- uh, uh, prosecution of this project would seriously delay others, which in the minds of the division have much more immediate promise of combat application. Project Pigeon was revived by the Navy, however, in 1948 as Project Orcon. And it was canceled in 1953 when the reliability of electronics guidance systems were proven. <laughs> so, mm. I I like this one because, um, I like them pecking at the screen, and I like the <laughs> fact that it got phased out by computers. <laughs> yeah, it's like a weird transition of technology. It's funny the. Uh like the contradiction between what was capable and the weird sort of, you know, methods they had to use to employ that. Yes. Yes. Now, one of the reasons why I picked this article is it's like, I mean, I already did a pigeons warfare type one, but I am interested in uh, BF Skinner. Like, um, yeah, my, my dad had some of his books and uh, behavioralism in general is kind of interesting. So, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, all right. Do you want to move into a game? Yeah, sure. All right. I have you going to go first? Yes, I've got 
I've got, uh, let me qualify this game first. It's a little different. Um, I'm going to try applying what's called the read technique on you. Okay? Mm Mm-hmm. So, the read technique is a method of questioning suspects to try to assess their credibility. Supporters argue that the read technique is useful in extracting information from otherwise unwilling suspects. While critics have charged the technique can elicit false confessions from innocent persons, especially children. The term read technique is a registered trademark of the firm Johnny Reed and Associates, which offer training courses in the method which they have devised. While the technique is widely used by law enforcement agencies in North America, it has been criticized for its history of eliciting false confessions. Okay? Mm Mm-hmm. The re-technique consists of three-phase process beginning with fact analysis, followed by the behavioral analysis interview, a non-accusatory interview designed to develop investigative and behavioral information, followed when appropriate by the read nine steps of interrogation. In the read technique, interrogation is an accusatory process in which the investigator tells the suspect that there is no doubt of his or her guilt. The interrogation is in the form of a monologue presented by the investigator rather than a question and answer format. The demeanor of the investigator during the course of the interrogation is ideally understanding, patient, and non-demeaning. The re-technique user's goal is to make the suspect gradually more comfortable with confessing. This is accomplished by the investigators first imagining and then offering the suspect various psychological constructs as a justification for their behavior. For example, an admission of guilt might be prompted by the question, did you plan this out or did it just happen on the spur of the moment? This technique uses a loaded question that contains an unspoken, implicit assumption of guilt. The idea is that the person under interrogation must catch the hidden assumption and contest it to avoid the trap. Critics regard the strategy as hazardous, arguing that it is subject to confirmation bias, likely to reinforce inaccurate beliefs or assumptions, it may lead to prematurely narrowing an investigation. So, are you ready? Sure. Alright, I'm going to try applying the nine steps of interrogation to you. Alright? Mm-hmm. Joe, I know you shit your bed this morning. The police found it. They smelled it. I just want to give you the chance to explain why you would uh, shit the bed as an adult. <laughs> I don't I don't know what's going on, man. <laughs> well, it's not a big deal. I mean, you know, I've shit the bed before. You know, everyone shits the bed. You know what I mean? Like uh, you know, you wake up and shit, you know? It's not a big what? deal. <laughs> look, 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 look. You're joking. Like, no way I'm going to admit that I shit my bed this morning. Uh-huh. But you know, maybe sometimes people need it. You don't need to deny it, man. Mm. Why would you not commit the crime? Why would you not? <laughs> Why did you not shit the bed this morning? What's your proof? The cops smelled it, man. They have your dirty <laughs> pants. Uh, What's your proof? Why Why did you not shit the bed this morning, man? Uh, I, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> why did you... How did you not... You didn't do this, right? Why didn't you not we, do this? You can't prove, like, you can't prove a negative. You can only prove that something happened. The cops smelled it, man. You're going to go down for this anyway. Everybody (laughs) knows you should. It's, dude, it's all over Facebook. (laughs) Look, 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 like, you're Uh, like, you're like, I didn't shit the bed. uh Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Am I supposed to be saying that? No, no, no. Like, look, look, you're, you're just like, oh, this is a joke, right? Like, but let me give you an alternative question. There's two things that could happen. You shit the bed, 
and you know you smeared it all over yourself and you're crazy uh-huh. or you shit the bed and you you know you just don't want anyone to know and i can understand that uh, man i don't know about this <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I, you got through almost all. The ninth step of the interrogation is to document your admission or confession. <laughs> so you made it. You 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 beat it. Good for you. All right. All right. So was that the whole game? Direct confrontation. Advise that the evidence has led the police to the individual. Shift the blame away to another person or set of uh, circumstances. Develop themes that would psychologically justify or excuse the crime. Discourage the suspect from denying their guilt. Give the suspect a reason why they did not commit the crime. Try to use this to move them towards a confession. Reinforce sincerity. The suspect will become quieter and listen. See, this is where you started not doing it. <laughs> like, if, like, it was, like it's, it, it, it got it, hard to follow. The, well, I, the biggest challenge is that you can't really do an interrogation over the phone. I guess so. No, but like, listen, at six, uh, step six, if the suspect cries at this point, infer guilt. So that's the thing. Like, if I, if I had you in handcuffs and had like my sleeves rolled up, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> I can't. It is. You're right. You're right. All right. Well, let me wrap I, up. Uh-huh. You're also. You would also. I mean, this is just advice. You don't talk to any police officer without a lawyer. I mean, that's the. the big that's good one. advice. Yeah. All and right. You well, just keep. You keep saying it. You keep saying, uh, "I I won't I won't talk. I won't answer questions without an attorney." No. Let me, I will say this, like, even if you couldn't get one, if you're in a circumstance, act exactly like the way Joe did. When I was asking questions, he's like, well, I don't know if I can do this, man. What are you talking about? That's exactly what you should do. <laughs> well, that seems like your, that seems like your advice. I would just say, like, don't say anything. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course. But if you're going to say anything, say what Joe said. Because he's just like, this is a game I don't understand. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't the best. Uh, I was also prepping for my game. <laughs> oh no, no, I get it. I get it. Wait, hold on. Let me no, wrap. I'm... Let me wrap it up. Let me wrap. Let me wrap up the topic. All right. All right. So their uh, critics of the technique claimed it was too easy to produce false confessions with children. The use of the technique on youth is prohibited in several European countries because of the incidence of false confessions and wrongful convic- uh, convictions that result. In Canada, Judge Mike Dinkle ruled in 2012 that stripped to its bare essentials, the Reed technique is a guilt presumative, confrontational, psychologically manipulative procedure whose purpose is to extract the confession. John Reed and Associates maintains it's not the technique that causes false or coerced confessions, but the detectives who apply improper interrogation procedures. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the big problem with the interaction we just had was that we both know it's something that didn't, definitely didn't occur, and we both know that no police were at my house. So, right. I mean, be, it'd be better if it was something more plausible. Mm hmm. Or a thing that you had reason to suspect that I may have done illegal. That was illegal. Well, yes, <laughs> it's agree. not. It's it's not a good. It's not a good. Uh, it's not a good thing, though. It's not a good way to get to get uh, information. A, it's not. It's not a good. It's not good police work. Well. This is the last... I thought this was interesting. There's alternative models. The peace model developed in Britain encourages more of a dialogue between investigator and suspect. In 2015, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police adopted a new standard influenced by the peace model. Sergeant Darren Mm -hmm. Carr, who trains police with the new approach, described it as less Kojak and more Dr. Phil. Hmm. It emphasizes we- information gathering over eliciting confessions and discourages investigators from presuming a suspect's guilt. Mm. 
now? That, yeah, I mean, I was attracted to this because I, I, you know, it's such like a police procedural, like cop drama thing. It's like we know you did it, dude. <laughs> you know? it's, like, it seems like that could this could also be a game. What do you mean? Like a card game. Oh, what like uh, like uh, interrogation? Like interrogation techniques? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There's no. there's the the seed of something there, but there's there is some weird game that is about betrayers. I think it's called like Werewolf or something. I don't know. Anyway, anyway. Yeah, Werewolf. That's the thing that it's like a big. I mean, that's 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 like a big uh, a big um, like convention game where like one person's the werewolf and you're sort of killing people off. Oh, Mafia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple variations of this. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, a party game from the USSR modeling a conflict between an informed minority, the Mafia, and an uninformed majority, the innocents. So, yeah, it Mm. is about, like, it's about lying. It's a role-play game about lying. Mm. All right, well, I've got a, a, a... Game for you. That's her. It's a uh, it's a sports championship game. Okay. And uh, and what it is, I want you to guess who is the winner of uh, WWF and later WWE WrestleMania events. All right, you got. It's got to be multiple choice because I there's no fucking way. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you who was in the match. All right. So WrestleMania one is a tag team event between Hulk Hogan and Mr. T versus Rowdy Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff, Mr. Wonderful. Rowdy Roddy. No, I'm sorry. It was Hulk Hogan and Mr. T. Oh. All right. The next year we have. Oh, fuck. Hulk Hogan versus King Kong Bundy in a steel cage match. Um. All right, like Hulk Hogan's a sweetheart. He just won the big Gawker thing, and he won that last question. I'm gonna say Hulk Hogan won. Hulk Hogan did win again. Yes, he always wins. Uh. In all everything. right. WrestleMania 3, which took place March 29th, 1987. Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant. Andre. Oh, I'm sorry. Hulk Hogan won. Mm. But uh, there was a. It seems like there was a rematch later on. They were both disqualified for using a steel chair. And in the next, the next uh, WrestleMania, the uh, the championship was vacant, so it was to determine who the new champion was. Uh, Why was it declared vacant? Uh, I guess because in the rematch they were both disqualified, so maybe he got stripped of his uh, title. It was uh, Randy I mean, Rand, Randy Savage versus Ted uh, Diabisi. Diabisi. Diabasi, the Million Dollar Man. I've I've never been able to pronounce his name. I always I always. Uh, like when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I thought it was Diabase. Is it like Italian? You think? D- uh, I don't. Yeah, the, it seems like it seems plausible. There's a great theme song for him. Where he's like, everyone's got a price. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's pretty good. Ah, uh, yeah, no, I, it, anybody check out that song. It's really good. His intro walking theme. <laughs> So who was so who is uh, it? it was Ted DiBiase versus Randy Savage. Randy Savage. Yeah. 
I'm just going to go with basic bitch answers. Randy Savage. Randy Savage is correct. Ted DiBiase should have won. (laughs) Because everyone has a price. (laughs) All right. The next one, uh, Randy Savage versus Hulk Hogan. Fuck. Disqualification. Yeah, that's a hard one, right? Trick, trick question. Trick question. No one won. Oh, God, I got to find out. Uh, it's a weird thing because... Technically, Hulk won, but the fans think Randy won. Or some shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, some bullshit. You can't yeah. have two heads. Like, they're, like... I know Randy was a heel for the most part, but like they're they're definitely two faces though. They're two like golden boys. They can't make it so easy, you know. It's it says it says Hulk won, but for whatever reason, the next year, the next WrestleMania, uh, he is uh, Hulk is not listed. Oh no, he's listed as the champion, and his opponent, the Ultimate Warrior, is also. Listed as a champion. So that would be WrestleMania 6 in 1990. So what happened? Hulk technically won, but Ultimate Warrior also won? <laughs> well, this is this is the next year. There are two champions facing each other. Uh-huh. The, Hulk was the uh, World Heavyweight Champion, and Ultimate Warrior was the Intercontinental Champion. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. I kind of like. So you yeah. actually, you actually know this stuff. No, I fucking don't. Like, I know mad dudes though that like. I know certain things in a truly in, encyclopedic way, but I don't know wrestling that way. But I know a lot of guys who do, and mm-hmm. uh, but keep going. Let me see. Like, they're all gonna think I'm fucking. Imbecile, <laughs> based on my answers, probably it's fine. Though. Yeah, I, I have no idea about any of this. I know. No, all right, let's hear some more. Let's hear some more. I, well, I do want... you know who it was? Huh? Do you know who won? No. Ultimate Warrior. That was in 1990. Did you ever see his like videos, like his character, like what they're trying to sell with him? Yeah, I've seen some of he's like always he's always like uh in like he's always uh like addressing himself as the greatest or referring to himself as the greatest warrior. Yeah, uh, yeah. But literally, I don't know. No, wh- wh- <laughs> I you know, this is one I feel like he had a very Nietzschean style cuz like his thing was like uh I'm getting the injection from the gods, like, you know, of power. Like, you know, like, I mean, like, I wouldn't say pagan, but kind of like, uh, like there's like a real primordial, like pre-Christian, like intensity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, am I, I like, I, I guess, I mean, even his look, you know what I mean? Like, mm. I, I, it was, it was, it would sort of seem like a weird, like neon version of like uh, I su- I think it's the like Native American warrior, but yes, uh, again, yes, that's exact. Uh, that I I thought the same fucking thing. I did not respect that character very much. I think <laughs> from like visual stimuli, but when I heard his uh, diatribe, like uh, you know his his gimmick, I was like swept up. I was like, this is kind of interesting. Like this is not what I thought. It's kind of pseudo intellectual, you know what I mean? Like it's mm. weird. It's it's not what you would expect from uh, that shit. But you know, and, and maybe it is all just like a fucking Native American rant, though. You know what I mean? Like wise man shaman shit. And oh, I'm gonna be spoiling it for myself. But I thought right. it was oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's hear the next. Let's hear the next. Next one, WrestleMania seven, nineteen ninety one. Sergeant Slaughter versus Hulk Hogan. Fuck. Um, it seems like Hogan always wins, but Sergeant Slaughter had a big dick too. I'm gonna say him, Slaughter. Oh, it was Hulk Hogan. Yeah, always Hogan. What the fuck am I doing? Just like I- I'm envisioning how it should have been. <laughs> as a as a side note, Sergeant Slaughter won uh, the Royal Rumble that followed that in. 
January of the following year. Popular character. Uh, oh, no, wait. He... No, no. Sergeant Slaughter won the Royal Rumble immediately before WrestleMania 7. Yeah, false. It's supposed to give me false yeah. hope. All right, so we have Next. here... Eight is... Uh, Rick Rick Flair versus Randy Savage. Randy. Let's see. Uh, it was... What are we at? We're on... Randy Savage. which one we're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus Nick we're on, Flair. We're, we're on WrestleMania 8. They're on two different pages, so I'm <laughs> flipping back and forth. WrestleMania so 8, Randy Savage. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know what it is? It's always going to be the guy that's more of a face because they got to sell shit. This is about legend building. It's never going to be the underdog. Like I, I, I can get these every time now. Let's, let me so you're saying it. you're saying in WrestleMania nothing is left up to chance. In WrestleMania, that is career defining shit. I guarantee you. I, I think I, I I have the enough pattern recognition to recognize it's always going to be the guy who sells more. Like Hulk Hogan versus Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan. You know what I mean? Randy Savage versus anybody else, Randy Savage. You know what I mean? Like, mm. Let me hear the next. I bet I can do All this. Right. The next one, uh, WrestleMania 9, uh, 1993, Bret Hart versus Yokozuna. That's tough. Bret Hart. Ooh, it's Yokozuna. Fuck, dude. All right, all right, all right, come on. Come on. <laughs> All right. Uh, Statistical anomaly. <laughs> Ten, again, Yokozuna versus Bret Hart. This is 10, and this is in 94. All right, all right. I'm going to double down on Bret Hart. Bret Hart. Uh, yes, correct. Yeah, all right, all right. Roddy Piper was the guest referee. He died recently. It's terrible. Yeah. Do you like uh do you like um uh They Live? I haven't seen it. I know all about it. Kick ass and chew bubble gum. That's all I yeah. know. Alright, we have ninety five, WrestleMania eleven, Diesel versus Shawn Michaels. I don't know who the fuck Diesel is. I don't uh, know Diesel either. I, I know Shawn Michael. I don't know Diesel. I'm going to apply my theory. Was it Shawn Michael? Actually, it's not listed on the other list. i got to go into the main article. It's a very weird thing. The The WrestleMania does not have, like, the list of WrestleMania in mm-hmm. WrestleMania, it doesn't have who won, only who fought. And they have a separate list of champions. Oh, but I it, see. It's, it's mixed. It's mixed, uh... It's it's uh so it's all different types. Well, you know what? Uh, it's a good thing we're fucking pros at this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, we uh, there should be a link. They should be combined. It, it looks like Diesel won. Diesel offered Sean Fuck. a rematch afterwards, so that would lead me to believe that Diesel won. All right. We might be getting out of territory now. Let me hear the next one. All right. Uh, Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels in a 60-minute Iron Man match. Bret Hart was a big hero. He was a huge face. People loved him. Always Bret mm-hmm. Hart. He's like Hulk, he's like a sleeper Hulk Hogan. Uh, this was a 60-minute Iron Man match in which Michaels won 1-0 to o in overtime. Fuck, dude! He was like the bad boy. What the fuck? Yeah, I remember. Uh, I had, uh, I had, I had uh, WWF Rubble, Royal Rumble for um, for Super Nintendo, and yeah. Shawn Michaels was my preferred character. Because you're a fucking little bad boy. Well, because his his special move was fairly easy to do. <laughs> yeah, like Luke but they were, they were all <laughs> they were all pretty easy to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but I liked him because he was a little badass. <laughs> I don't I don't even remember why I uh, I mean wait, wait, I don't know hear- why I he was my main my go to. 
All right. Uh, Let me hear one from like the Attitude Era. Like, what's some tight '90s shit? Like, let me see if I can. Uh, that was the era my good buddy was interested in. Let me see if I can fucking suss it. Well, out. that was '96, '97, WrestleMania 13. That's where they switch back over to numbers to Arabic numbers instead of Roman numerals. <laughs> Psycho Sid versus The Undertaker in a no disqualification match. Undertaker. Uh, that was 13. Check here. 13. The Undertaker. All right, yeah, yeah. It's gotta sell. Gotta sell those funny hats. The dead All right, you're man getting rules. Ma- your thing doesn't always work out, but it's you know. You'd say mostly true. Well, that whole fucking Bret Hart Yokozuna thing is interesting because Yokozuna was a superstar as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they, they he traded. Was, he was also in that game, and he was slightly, he was slightly less muscular than the other guys. He was more of a a big boy. Uh, yeah, but he he wasn't fat in the game. He was just sort of like uh, like doughy, but I, not I, really fat. Not like I liked it. Like it's interesting to me. Like um, like uh, it's like you have this idea of martial arts or like body fighting. Where it's all about tight muscles. But then there's this theory about, like, mass. That's, like, fat guys that apply it well. Like, and crush. Like, that is an interesting dynamic, like, I feel like. I like, have I, I have no idea which is... I would go with muscular over fat, but... I, I would... You know, did you ever see that movie, um... 13 Warriors or something? It's about, like... The Thirteenth Warrior with uh, Antonio Banderas. Yeah, yeah, he plays like uh, Islamic uh, warrior that joins Vikings. Yeah, like a Saracen, right? Mm-hmm. There's like this famous fight where uh, it's like he, like Antonio Banderas, has like this little Viking buddy who's kind of mm-hmm. like this squirrely little uh, long-haired blonde fucker. You know, he's like an older guy. He's kind of scrawny and like shady and uh this character is best friends with antonio you know they're tight and uh the friend gets involved in like a feud and he has to fight this goliath this huge guy and antonio's like you'll be ted to pieces <laughs> he's like like i can't let this happen and uh his friend's like oh whatever and he you know he punks the big guy you know what i mean he gets him to bend over and he cu- cuts off his head like and i think that there's some you know what i mean like uh uh cleverness that's what's about mm. if you're smarter you don't got to hit harder yeah but we're assuming like equal assuming equal sort of uh you know intelligence or cunning i would put the advantage to the muscular man over the Fat or uh, scrawny man? No, I yeah, nine times out of ten, yeah, I suppose so. All right, the next one, Shawn Michaels. This is WrestleMania fourteen. They're back on Roman numerals. Uh, this was ninety eight. Shawn Michaels versus Steve Austin. Special guest enforcer Mike Tyson. Steve Austin. Uh, yes, Stone Cold won. Stone Cold's debut. Uh, as a champion. WrestleMania 15, 1999, The Rock versus Steve Austin in a no disqualification match. Special guest referee Mankind. The Rock versus Steve Austin. Not yet. Steve Austin. The Rock will have his day. Steve Austin. Uh, which one were we on? Steve Austin versus The Rock, 98. 99. This is 15. Uh, oh, God. They're making it so hard to find it. Yes, Austin again. Yeah, it's like making like The Rock becoming heel, uh, face-ish and Steve Austin becoming heelish. All right, we'll do, we'll do one more. WrestleMania... 2000 they've forgotten the the they've done away with the 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 numbering and they've gone straight to the year 2000 which it was all right uh triple h versus <laughs> the rock versus b 
Big Show versus Mick Foley in a fatal four-way elimination match. It's neither of the fucking crazies. It's not Mick Foley. It's not fucking Big Show. Uh, it's fucking Triple H. Uh, let's see what year we're on. Oh, God. They make it so hard to find all this shit. Uh, it looks like it was... Uh, I'm going to have to go to the article. They don't have it listed on the other one. Yeah, they need to improve this. They need to say who won. Yo, let's get on this. <laughs> it's about making we, Wikipedia better, too, you know? <laughs> yeah. The WrestleMania page should have who won each WrestleMania in the page. I shouldn't have to go to a separate page about WWE Listen, the most, the most important thing about Wikipedia is its tables, which are the best tables online, and that table should have the winner. I'm going to read it live. Uh, in the beginning of the match, Show, Press, Slam, Triple H, and Rock. However, all three competitors then attack Show. The situation allowed The Rock to eliminate Show after delivering a rock bottom into a pinfall. After the elimination, Foley delivered a double arm DDT on Triple H. Uh, Triple H retaliated, performing a pedigree on Foley into, onto a steel chair. This resulted in a pinfall in Foley's elimination. After Foley was eliminated, The Rock and Triple H brawled in and out of the ring with neither <laughs> superstar gaining the advantage over one another. Although Triple H gained the advantage when Vince hit The Rock with a steel chair, two consecutive times, thus turning Vince heel. The attack with the steel chair allowed Triple H to pin The Rock to retain the WWF championship. Such intrigue. So is The Rock. Yeah. And it says The Rock, uh, after the match, The Rock gave The Rock bottom to Vince. Shane and Stephanie McMahon. So it's really like, uh, it's like Caesar. <laughs> no, it, it, so Triple H won that one. Triple H, yeah, I was Triple right. H, yeah, no, you were right. I really have very little knowledge about any of this. Uh, any of this, it had to have been Triple H. Well, I don't know. I know The Rock is well liked. No, no, that's true. It sounds like he sounded pretty heroic in that situation as well, though. Yeah, Vince Vince hit him with a chair. All right. Uh, All right, well, this is a pretty good episode. Uh, I'm your host, Joe. I'm David. Oh, hold on. Let me me do a plug. Uh, All right, well, that was a pretty good episode. Uh, I just want to get a quick plug in. Uh, Check out my my post-apocalyptic tarot deck, Omega Land. Uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm your host, Joe. I'm David. Uh, have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>